both the live audio. Whoa, 200 is way too big. with that. Project Isekai. The thing is, for the longest time, I've had an idea for a game, in a game engine really, that made parody of the Isekai genre, genre in general. And with the Board Game Workshop's yearly design contest, especially this year, where they have multiple tiers of the contest for a simple, medium, and heavyweight game. Uh, this is probably the best time to do it, so that actually gets the best amount of eyeballs, like, uh, judging eyeballs on it. The thing about the board game design contest is that I don't really care about winning the cash prize. I don't think anybody cares about winning, like, the small amount of cash prize involved with it. It's more about the fact that they have judges from every corner of that industry. And in three stages, the judges will be giving you feedback on both the design and implementation and any possible improvements you can make to the game. And that, that is the actual prize. Um, having industry veterans tell you the best way to optimize your game for the general public and not to violate any NDAs or anything but I happen to know quite a few people involved in the Kickstarter business and may in fact um no let's not to tell too much about that but short story is I think I have a pretty good idea a pretty good way to implement it and a pretty good pipeline to actually have it have it implemented eventually. I'm not going to give any like predictions for how long it might take me to push out the product for the first time or anything. Um, although it's not my first time designing the system, it's just my first time trying to take it seriously. But I'm in a unique situation at this point in my life where I can actually capitalize on my ideas. Now the important thing to remember, of course, is that ideas are the easy part. Um, very much so the easy part. In fact, I've been in the creative business long enough to know that ideas are the cheapest part. Anybody can have an idea. The implementation, how to bring it to life, is by far harder than having an idea. To the point where original ideas may actually be counterproductive to actually being productive. Well, that was badly worded. Counterproductive to have it to realize the vision you want simply because you're going to be get, uh, second guessing yourself so much along the way. That's not always true, um, but it's definitely better than not to let go of any preconceived notions that you have to be 100% original in what you're doing in order to have it succeed. That is usually proven false. That said, yeah, even in this case, in, the, in for Project Isekai, I will, be, of course, be working on this title. Um, it has some obvious inspirations. Uh, 
the biggest of which is has nothing to do with anime whatsoever. It's actually Netrunner. Specifically, the Android Netrunner card game, back when it was being handled by uh, Fantasy Flight Games. Um, I am very fond of the Netrunner card game, especially the Netrunner play system. It was confusing as hell to get into it initially, but the asymmetrical design, especially the uh, the competitive asymmetrical design, where the actions you would take as a corporation or a runner were directly uh, were only loosely similar to what the other player would be able to do, and yet they they link together in a very beautiful way to create what was effectively a very narrative heavy story. And yet this is also the same game I was most disappointed by because their attempt to make a story driven narrative legacy project was I think a, an astounding failure. So Project Isekai will have I think quite a few Netrun influences. Um, not to make it an actual like direct clone of the game um, for various reasons you want to avoid that uh, one of the reasons why you don't you can't buy official Netrunner products anymore you can only buy the community version is specifically that the engine for Netrunner belongs to Wizard of the Coast and when Fast Flight Games and the greater like uh, in the host company they, they belong to was sold off to a French uh, conglomerate they were not able to renew the license for whatever reason. Which pisses me off because I really love that game. And now, now I just have a moldering box of cardboard and memories, very fond memories. So I want to avoid duplicating that runner entirely. But I think I can still make a game that plays off its strengths. Anyhow. The first bit of the design is to concept is to fully lay out the like conceptual grounds for it, which is not just the name, although I will be changing the name up. It can't it it can't stay as Project Isekai, that'd be stupid. But the theme of it, the basic mechanics I want to see, uh the basic mechanic the uh basic game loop I I think the player should experience playing this game. And of course, the ultimate victory condition to actually determine like who wins around right or if it should be something with a victory condition which it likely will um there are quite a few games especially co-op games where the victory condition is more point based and or abstract but i kind of don't like those i feel like it takes away from like the uh moment to moment view of the story if you can't like really grasp like the narrative core so at least in my case i want to start off with a strong like narrative basis like Playing the game tells you a story, and it's very obviously a story that's being told to you as the pieces or cards or dice are being played or rolled or whatever. So we're switching over to, let's see. The game abstract. What else? Structure. Do I really want to get to flavor immediately? I think best when there's like a flavor attached to the story at least. And... What's the other part I want to do? Oh wait, right. Between abstract and basic structure it should be game type. Like tabletop games, if if you're unfamiliar with the modern state of tabletop games, suffice to say it's gone extremely diverse. We're no longer talking about like Candyland or Monopoly or bullshit like that. Or even just like card games like Magic the Gathering, right? Like, 
if somebody tells you we're gonna play a Euro style resource management game, does that actually tell you anything? Does that actually ring a bell to you? Because it does with me. Worker placements, little meeples, uh, probably some involvement of dice, but only to uh, the actual level of RNG involved is minimal compared to the user decisions. Although I still generally don't really like dice games that much. If somebody were to tell you that they wanted to to try playing a legacy game, that means I have to tell you to that they that they plan to play a game where not only will scenarios play out depending on your choices, but you will you may very well destroy physically destroy cards or game objects to prevent you from being able to backtrack and make another decision at that point. Thus, at the end, of course, uh, the end state of a legacy game is something that's completely unique to that playgroup. So game type matters, um, at least to remind myself what I've been working on it and uh, the direction I want to be able to go with the game. Uh, basic flavor. Um, concepting it will then be followed by laying out the basic rules. Once I have the basic rules, then I'll be needing to make basic prototypes and then adjusting rules as my prototypes show any flaws in my game design or so on and so forth. But we'll get to that, we'll get to that much, much later. For now, let's work on the basics. Abstract. So a lot of easy guys. Well, that's it's common knowledge, but a lot of easy guys basically build their world around Dragon Quest tropes, like the whole thing about a demon king, uh, demon generals having to level up your, your party of like magic fighter, uh, mage fighter healer tropes. Those are all like old school Dragon Quest parody stuff, right? Like if you're talking about. JRPGs, there's nothing more fundamental than Dragon Quest. Like, forget how fundamental, it's bedrock. And unfortunately that also 
fortunate or unfortunate. It's a rather value neutral. Every single one of its tropes belongs. Uh, every every so of like, no, not what am I thinking? Um, many many fancy tropes in Japan, and especially Japanese manga, tend to rely on Dragon Quest trappings as a result, because that is their fun, uh, like fundamental basis. So, if you're talking, if you're talking like fancy isekai, you're talking demon kings. If you're talking demon kings, there has to be like some kind of like god granting you the power and the over, no, granting you the overpowered uh, uh, relics or special abilities to go about busting up the demon army in order to in order to progress. Right. Uh, give me a second. So that's a big reason why I chose the uh, 1v1 like asymmetrical structure in the first place. Because the, the objective of the Izukai hero and the objective of the Demon King are extremely different. And how they advance their agendas tend to be extremely different as well. Um, for the Izukai protagonist especially. Let's see, let's write that down. Survival is the most, survival and growth is the most important part of the protagonist faction, right? And that has to be, rep that should ideally be represented gameplay. They level up, they and or they gain new gear, uh, they gain new allies, although, although the allies will always be, let's see, the allies will always be weaker than the, the hero, right? At least by the end of their journey, the hero should be the most powerful, most well equipped with a legendary sword or whatever. That matches to win the day, right? Which raises an obvious question if we're going to make a game about this. What's a Demon King's like actual incentive to play right? Um, let me see how to put it. The Demon King faction um, has to be compelling. They cannot be a passive group. And it's in a standard Isekai or, uh, setting or a standard JRPG, however, they tend to be pretty passive. They're only a looming threat who has rampaging monsters that, for whatever nebulous reason, is terrorizing the countryside or, or oppressing the local governments and, and civilians and so on and so forth, causing all sorts of nasties. But the only excuse you ever get on their end is that they're evil and therefore they do this kind of shit. Um, the burden on my end is much more significant than that. I have to provide a reason for players to want to be a Demon King, and furthermore, to be an active one, however active that, that may be, right? In short, there are stories that, that I explore that to some extent, but let me see. Like, it's not uncommon to have an isekai parody that deals directly with the demon side, right? To give them motivation, to give them, like, personality and history and so on and so forth. But using isekai, using the fact that people are basically tearing holes through the fabric of reality, or gods, rather, are tearing holes through the fabric of reality to grab an ordinary, like, businessman or student or whatever and dragging them off to adventures in another world, I think I can provide a better excuse for why Demon Kings exist at all.
And the reason for that, well, actually, no, the reason for that will go into flavor. Hmm. myself a reminder. And my answer to the Demon Faction's playstyle, at least. They provide the dungeon that heroes have to cl uh, claw their way through for their equipment, for their levels, and everything else, right? So that means I need a reason to need a dungeon in the first place. That means we have the game type. Well, I already said the game type early on, but it's metrical competitive. Although this also raises the question: Do I actually want it to be like all out netrunner, or do I want it to be something more like? Um, a tile based game where you literally like buy dungeon components right and then like install it in the game for the for the adventure to explore and your hope is that you design a, a dungeon with a sufficiency of of traps of uh magic circles of enemies that you can defeat the hero party and force them to start over or something along those lines uh this is obviously the concept insane so i haven't completely made up my mind yet but I should. I should. Um, a card game would be simple. Kind of simple. Oof. Mm. Rubbing my temples. You can't see that, obviously, because I don't have control over hands with this model. But I definitely rubbing my temples of frustration because um, it could go either way. And there are challenges to either way. Um, I know for a fact... Well, no, actually, I can't say for a fact, because I don't actually know which judges are up this year's for this year's contest. But I know for sure that there are a lot of judges that tend to uh, tend to be a harder sells if you just make a strict uh, card game, and that's mostly because well, card games are easy, and they all and because they're easy, they tend to be heavily overdone. Like, there may not be a lot of Nether clones out there, but they are. There are an absolute ton of uh, clones of uh, Magic: The Gathering, or of uh, Ascension deck builders. The deck builders, especially, are heavily overdone. Although I did like cut my teeth on deck builder designs in the first place, because sure they're overdone to the point of like ad nauseum, but they also tend to be fun in general. Um, engine builders, especially, uh, feel good to play once they go off. And if they don't go off, competitive engine builders at least have some, like, minimum of, like, pop-off ability. To, like, even if you're not the one with the engine that goes off and, like, destroys the whole board, 
seeing what's possible when your much more experienced friend builds one and demolishes you at least like gives you an appreciation for how the mechanics t tend to tie together, right? But like de deck builders are, I have a couple ideas for deck builders I kind of want to explore later. At least like sometime further down the line or whatever year comes up. But as a contest entry, I'm inclined against it. Not for any strategic reason, just because that, all sympathetic reasons. Because I am almost positive, like, they will get deck builders as well. Especially after popularity of a Slay the Spire. Which, by the way, was made and programmed by a Netrunner community member. That did very well for himself. But everybody wants to make a Slay the Spire. And that means that you probably don't want to get, you don't want to make another one. If you want to have as many judges take you as seriously as possible and give you the criticism. Um, I want to give them as few reasons as possible to pass on my design. Not because I think my design will be any good, starting out. Um, not to, well, it is a little humble brag. But as a writer, a lot of my first drafts tend to get past my editors, even if I think they, even if I personally think they could be improved. But I don't like it when they do that. I like it when there is sufficient feedback to push out a draft two or draft three that actually shows like significant improvement over the original material. Unfortunately, that's why they made me editor instead. <sighs> well, let's see what else. Uh, competitive 1v1 asymmetrical game. I think we'll actually still use some card play aspect because it's really hard to have like repeating abilities or like variable actions without a deck type structure, especially a manipulable deck type structure. But the idea to make an actual tile dungeon where the adventurer has to like flip over the tiles to see what kind of cards you, are el you as the Demon King is eligible to play has something to speak for it from a design and like little narrative standpoint. So then it's a matter of how it actually plays out. This one will take a lot of thinking. Oh, nice. I'm seeing... Yeah, Tell Your Life's having an Among Us game right now. That sounds like a lot of fun. Especially with a new map coming out at the end of the month. I think that you may be a little early on the trigger there. But anyhow, back to the game structure.
installs an R fan, and if it's around an R fan, I'm thinking you probably will get to whether or not these are tiles or cards later. I just want the, like the basic, the basic loop. What's the word I'm looking forward to? Describe your resources. Fungible? I think it was. Yeah, fungible. That means I need So that particular structure rule, if the opposing player can prove that there isn't a viable path from the outside of the dungeon to the archive chamber, the archive ability punches the demon key instead. That one is inspired by Galaxy Trucker. 
which is uh, an extremely chaotic game, extremely entertaining to play, and extremely frustrating when uh, you uh, you have a massive lead and the asteroid uh, hits you at just the right point to knock out all of your engines and all of your lasers at once, leaving you a derelict, a floating derelict in the middle of space. It's a very, very fun game. Completely unlike any other, like, unlike any other tabletop game I've played so far. It's not the most serious game, but the, uh, the fact that you can basically build a spaceship out of junk as long as it's, as long as it's uh, legally connected, or at least as long as nobody notices that you've made an illegal connection somewhere, that's pretty freaking funny. <laughs> and that rule's inspired by that. As long as the, like, if the player doesn't notice, you can get away with anything. But the moment that an opposing player notices that you fucked up your build, everything explodes in your face. I think that's awesome. I think that's an awesome mechanic. I should probably copy that as well. Technically speaking, I guess that's a that, I guess that counts as a tile placement game, but it's not that simply like to find. It's more like a chaos generator. Um, sure, you can defy chaos by building a ship with multiple layers of redundancy and lasers, cannons pointing every which way, and shields facing every single cardinal direction, and enough engine power and batteries to like blast you to Mars on a single trip. Well, not Mars, but any planet on a single trip. But the odds of finding the pieces before the count before the uh, countdown finishes, and then like the odds of not getting RNG to death, is not that great, which only adds to the entertainment level, honestly. All right, back to my game though. Let's see. See how do I want to go to play out? Pass this one else.
trying to think of how I want this side of the game to play. So, most games are symmetrically designed. Whatever one player can do, the other player, the other player can do at, in, in opposition to them. Uh, especially card games, the best design, the, well, honestly, any card game you can name is, is, a, is an example of symmetrical design. Uh, if it's poker, you're all drawing cards and trying to meet the same sort of win conditions. So you're just simply trying to get a better hand than them. And magic, uh, strictly speaking, it's not always symmetrical. If you're playing a spells only deck with no with uh, no creatures to do the combat phase with, you're obviously playing what is on its face a very very different game from from like green stompy aggro right where the whole objective for their deck is to use mana to summon big creatures and stop your face them um and yet the only reason why you play such different games is out of the player's decision to do so with the card pool available to both players but the fundamental rules will change, and the fundamental faces will change, and the fundamental win conditions are available to both sides. So it's still, it's still functionally a symmetrical game. Just asymmetrical decisions were made in the setup. Making a symmetrical game means presenting two different rule sets based on players, but designed in such a way that the rule sets intersect. Which is a bit more of a challenge. Just a bit. Just a bit. That's actually a pretty big challenge. <laughs> uh, thinking my way through this is a bit of a headache. And doing it top down especially means that I want the rules to fit the flavor instead of the other way around. Which is also a, its own sort of challenge, right? Nothing insurmountable though. It's not as if I haven't seen a dozen examples of this. But the examples I want to actually choose and template off versus the ones I'm ignoring. That takes thinking. It takes brain power. It takes caffeine. I've already drank through all my caffeine though. That's that's unfortunate.
basically hero killing. Uh, if they defeat the slime, obviously they gain XP and, and or gold and or like random equipment, depending on the card played by the Demon King. Right? And the Demon King should be able to design the army that they're playing to their satisfaction. The threats that they can feel, the traps that they can uh, put in the hero's way. But if the hero is unable to circumvent those traps, uh, they're fucked. And so is the faction that they're working for. Uh, I'm going to force the Isekai, the Isekai side player to totally start from the beginning if they squander their heroes. But I'm not going to give them nothing at all. What they can do is decide that they don't need to run through the whole dungeon right away. And instead, reset after an encounter. You know, go back to town, uh, go to bed. And because it's a JRPG style game, uh, going to bed heals everything. So by doing this, we've also made it a bit of a risk-taking game where you can basically decide whether or not you can afford to push for uh, push on, right? Um, it also, subtly, this also means that I can give the Demon King player a choice to field blank cards instead so that they can either encourage hero players to uh, take more risks than they really should or to fake them out with what seems to be a high difficulty path when really it's just a bunch of like cheap uh cheap blank cards that don't cost them any resources but uh costs the uh, hero like progression time right that makes sense right now like what stats are involved
And this little wrinkle here is a direct result of my experience with Deadrunner's Terminal Directive. To basically explain the event phase, I want something that changes the fundamental narrative of the of any one game to prevent. Like, even if you were to have the same characters played on either side by the same players with the same cards going through the same sort of progression, what I don't want is for every game to be identical. And the best way I can think of to do that is an event phase that throws a wrench into the... Uh, into the flow of the game, either changing specific rules, uh, changing what cards are, are available, changing what's uh, uh, the current state of the game, or even outright changing the nature of the game itself, right? Although nothing too wild, at least to start with. Um, the longer, if the game actually like gets published and like it's like through whatever like fantastical odds it proves popular, then obviously I can start exploring more and more wild options. But what I want to see right now is that both sides come into a game with a preset number of event cards. They slap it all down, shuffle around, and then based on certain, based on filling certain conditions, event triggers that throws the uh, state of the game into question. Or rewards one player over another. Just no, 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 no. Actually, no. Let's loop around. Let's loop back around. The event itself in the vacuum should not favor one player or another. But how the player defines their start, their opening strategy or overall strategy, can account for the events that they chose, whereas the opposing deck might not. Um. It's one thing to make an asymmetrical effect, but even symmetrical effects may be, as, may be asymmetrical in their impact. And the best example of this is actually Magic the Gathering's like, old staple board wipes, right? A 4-mana Wrath of God destroys everything on the field. Everything, regardless of who's playing it. And early on, especially during like, the first couple of weeks of, of the game's existence, and it's a common trap for newbie players too. To think that Wrath of God is therefore a bad effect compared to targeted kill spells. But, like, in most cases, granted, in most cases, you would rather play a 2 mana terror to kill the opposing uh, opposing player's creature, right? Like, it kills exactly what you want, it kills most things regardless of how beefy they are, and it only affects the opponent. But if the opponent, for example, is playing like three dozen uh, squirrel tokens, and all you've got is a blue flyer. A terrorist not gonna do shit. But Wrath of God will. And because the opposing player, they are playing a swarm strategy, or they are playing only like one or two creature-based wood conditions that they need to protect regardless of everything else, then that four mile to reset the board actually favors you more. Especially if you've built your deck to be effectively immune to it. Like land-based creatures or enchantment creatures that only turn into enchantments on the opposing team, uh, opposing player's turn, or if you spend mana to turn them from enchantment to creatures, or if you if you've done away with creatures entirely in a deck, and it's all based on artifacts, and you just need to build up a mana base, and you need to make sure that they don't rush it down before everything's ready. Then Wrath of God is not so equal. Destroying all creatures that can't be regenerated means nothing to you at that point. Because you're not reliant on what it's targeting. And thus, I want something similar for the event phase, where... Thematically, it's as if a volcano went off in the middle of a pitched battle between two opposing armies. But one of them happens to be an army made out of fire elementals. Under normal circumstances, the, vo the volcano going off would have been bad news for everybody. Under control circumstances, or at least like under strategically defined circumstances, a sufficiently wily opponent can take advantage of it, or a sufficiently canny like uh, general will have already planned for it, and was relying on it as the basically ticking clock for whatever deviant strategy they have planned. 
whether or not I can actually design a game that can successfully pull that off is a completely different thing. And the reason why I was disappointed with Netrunner's terminal directive was specifically because the game alterations didn't happen in the game and were often really minor effects. So the way that terminal directive works was that you would play a normal game of Netrunner and based on who won or lost or what cards were played, your next round would be affected by a new rule or a new set of cards that you would stash into your deck. And that made for really, really slow games because uh, uh, based on the decks you were playing in Netrunner, a round could either last five minutes or 50 minutes. Oof, stall decks. Actually, you know, 50 game, minute games at least still feel better than losing five minutes because you couldn't draw into the right ice, you couldn't get enough economy, and they top deck into all the agendas at once. That was rough. Netrunner is many things, but um, if you don't design your deck well, it was very easy to lose off RNG alone. Anyhow, even face. Uh, what was it? Mm, let's see, how do I want to find this? That's a good example I want to work with. Give me a second here. Just give me a second to blow my nose. What would be a good example?
No, starting with the hero player. If there's a specific reason for this. Uh, what I'm envisioning is a situation where the hero player, for instance, can choose a tile closest to the win condition, right? And then simply say, well, I slapped this with my own. Obviously, that's not supposed to be legitimate. Uh, but if they... No, no, no. The other way around. If we start with the Demon King instead, they choose any random tile. And still closer to the artifact that the hero player currently is... I don't want a situation where the hero player can, player can like freely decide. Well, I just go teleport cl closer to the win. Um, instead, what I want them to do is uh, if they see that the towel in front of them, which they've already encountered, is one that they're not currently equipped to uh, handle. Uh, then what they can do is simply swap it with a blank one or swap it with a random one to take to take their chances or if they already have an equipment or an ally or special ability that happens to counter what they've seen before uh, to put them to replace the one they're going to face with a more like advantageous position right Actually, no, this is a much more elegant way to do this. Instead of having each player do it, the hero player just chooses both. What would be a good example of a, of a Demon King card, though? Like, event phases, when they trigger, should basically act as a plot twist.
I haven't decided what the resource name will be. But a Fortune's Favor will basically be a generic like yoga card where both sides benefit. And the base of Town War, which basically acts as a way to annoy an excessively quick hero player without also rewarding the Demon King player, right? Uh, Town War should act its all the way fancy. Anyhow, I think this is pretty justified. Uh, but yeah. If you choose to play Time Warp as part as part of your event cards, it means that you're expecting to go against a a fast sort of player, one whose strategy depends on like rushing through before you can mount heavy defenses. So you can smash them, you can smash that pause button right on top of them. Assuming of course it shows up.
<sighs> I don't want some of the punishment. Let me think about on this a little bit. There are a number of there are a number of options available to me, but I'm not feeling them out to see what they're like, what I actually want to do with the game. Let me think. The methods I'm contemplating right now is like a permanent reduction in hand size. Assuming that I want them to be holding hand, uh, a hand of cards in the first place, which is not the most unreasonable assumption, but may not be where I want to take it. They could simply have like a limited number of HP themselves, which I feel is a viable and easy way to keep track of things, but feels awfully abstract because it's not in the board state itself. It's not in the field state. It's not in the tiles counted. It's not the number of artifacts they have on hand. It's not printed on, on any unit cards, etc. It'd be something that basically has to be tracked separately from the game itself which i could it's very common to use those kind of systems but if i can think of anything more clever that would be better now it's possible of course that we'll want to design like character cards with individual fail states like if they lose an artifact they have to do x and that's not the worst option either um it gives a lot of not just like replayability by having different character cards but a lot of design space by doing so I think to start with, I'll keep it simple. As the core starting design, I will use the HP metric. Every single time they lose an artifact, there's like a feedback effect, raw spray of magic, the DM King suffers a fatal blow.
there. I think that prevents potential shenanigans. Uh, what I want to do is make sure that, well, what I want to do is set up a strategic layer in the dungeon building phase of the game itself during the during the uh, Demon King's turn. Um, they can choose strategically to set up baits, for instance, where sure the first artifact is easy enough to get. But the one after, and the one after that, requires the player character to traverse a, what could be an exponentially more difficult dungeon, right? Now granted, that still semi-favors the player character as long as they're able and capable of uh, defeating whatever challenges get thrown in their face. Because by doing so, they gain more power, more artifacts, more allies, what's, uh, and more tricks in the back, basically, to circumvent the, the next challenge and gain even stronger. So a long dungeon is not, it's not necessarily a safe dungeon. And how to make it so that short dungeons still have impact is something that I'll have to consider. But that is the sort of like decision space I want to be putting the, uh, the Demon King player into. And of course, the opposing player as well. Like, do they want to prepare their decks or their their uh, pool of options for long grindy games or fast paced games? Um, how how much of a magic card they want to be basically? Um, if each time the Demon King loses HP, for instance, they gain significantly more resources to, resources to cast significantly more impacting spells then designing your deck to take advantage of long dungeons may not necessarily be the best bet. You may want instead like a deck full of consumables, of potions, or like one-time spell effects to just blast through and rip through as fast as possible, right? And that's something that, that I want the players to be able to account for, or design for, or to take a risk against. I think that this particular structure to how the game's supposed to play should be able to provide that. It also forces like a constant change to the dungeon layout itself, right? Uh, by removing up to eight tiles, you might be like eradicating a dungeon entirely and forcing the uh, Demon King to start over. Or you could you could be making it so that they can build alternative route uh, routes or make a maze even more difficult to traverse by giving them new ways to connect their tiles, new pieces to snake their way around, so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, that should make for a really, really like meaty uh, strategic level of the game. For both sides, hopefully. Hopefully, that is the ideal. Ideally, I make it so that way, uh, the more canny and insightful of a player you are, the more options the game gives you. Or you can just brute force it, force like a straight line dungeon, where they just have to go from point A to point B, and each particular point has an increasingly difficult challenge. That's also an option. I'm not going to dismiss that. If that is a viable way to play and the game ends up that way, that's fine. If it forces you instead to make like convoluted mazes, even better. Um, but that that's something I have to think about and like actually implement later on. If you see my model moving around, it's because I'm sitting up. Let me see, what else? We're actually at the hour and 30 minute mark on this stream, which is impressive, because it doesn't feel like it's been, been off that long. I've been mostly stuck in my own headspace. Um, I think after I get down to basic wind condition, we'll stop for the day, so I can get some food. And we'll continue with the design later on. Well, well, well that, that's for now though. Let's basically work out the basic win con. Uh, win con. Like put it into words, I don't forget.
Let me see. Mm. Well, the win condition for the Demon Flare is simple enough. That does it. Um, yeah, a crow god. Uh, you basically have five chances to recruit a hero that can possibly save your world. If you don't, the Demon King wins. The Demon King, on the other hand, can afford to lose up to X number of artifacts depending on who they are and what their strategic goal is before they succumb to injury. Um, I think this basic structure gives me a lot of wiggle room in terms of how to design like personality cards. Uh, what the Demon King's ability is, uh, whether or not they gain extra parts when they when they have when they lose HP, like they're getting more desperate or not. It also lets me like fine-tune like what their power levels are at any phase of the game, right? It also means that heroes can have extremely diverse effects. And who you feel as your starting hero, or maybe like heroes that can only be summoned after you lose one or the other, are also an option. Uh, I'll have to further develop the game before I can really choose how to uh, play that out. But the fact that I can think of at least three or four different options on the heroes alone is actually is actually a great thing. It means that the system can support like very diverse levels of uh, styles of play, right? It's not like you're playing poker where uh, before everything starts, you already know like exactly what the card values are, exactly what your decision spaces are, and exactly how the game's going to like play out, right? Or like even like with magic, where like Actually, no, magic is actually a really bad example of like what I criticize. Rather, it's a good example of this of the flexibility I want, where a one-one bird between two colors and two decks can fulfill very different functions. Um, could be like a mana generated dork for one mana, which is a huge value by the way, especially for a one-one bird. Or it could be like a counter spell on a stick, or a scries for two, or shit like that. It also means that because I have two very distinct win conditions or loss conditions based on what side you're playing, it's inherently, uh, like, for the hero side, when they lose, it's because they ran out of certain options and certain abilities, and they've been cornered into, like, an unfortunate state by losing certain heroes at certain stages of play. 
and the demons are more traditional HP countdown, but each HP countdown increases the tension of the game. Like, either it, like unlocks new options for them, uh, gives them a special ability, maybe triggers an event card, um, lets them put down free tiles, whatever. Uh, the, the state of play is very different compared to losing a hero card and the, a hero specific ability. So that emphasizes how different the sides are and how they approach the conflict. Which I'm satisfied with. Um, let me see. I've been streaming for 1 hour 43 minutes. Not bad. Not bad for my first attempt at designing this thing. Concepting should be taking, should ideally take less time than, say, writing down the entire set of starting rules and prototyping the entire extent of the first game, of the first iteration of the game. Hmm. Not bad if I say so myself. That's 735 words as well. Um. Let me write down a little bit of the basic flavor so I remember what I'm doing. And the twist here, this is the important twist too, and defines like how I approach the flavor. What I don't want to do is make a generic Isekai game, where it's basically, well it's the big one that's playing at the moment. What was it called? No, 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 no. Right. What I don't want to do is simply like retrick Mushoku Tensei or any other really generic isekais where you're supposed to take the setting seriously. What I want to do is um, give like at least the narrative capability to put in a lot of gray. So the first setting. The first setting is that the Demon King is extracting energy from the world. Like, what they're doing inherently corrupts the world around them. And therefore, 
the local baddies and the local bars have every reason to try to stop them. But can't, strictly speaking. At least not on their own. Uh, when you are creating an info war that messes with the fundamental laws of the world itself and feasts upon it for its food, um, that is a severe outside context problem, right? So you need an outside context solution. And the problem with an outside context solution is that it becomes somebody else's outside context problem. there. And that is my intention for this game. To present a playable drama between factions and a test of the thematic assumptions of the isekai genre itself. Questioning why demons might exist, what, what drives them to do such abhorrent things to the countryside, and whether or not the gods are not complicit in their own destruction. You know, just the fun stuff. So yeah. I think I can stop here. I think I'm pretty satisfied with this, in fact. Uh, this and so many, bullet, so many bullet points is basically the, the vision I have for this particular game and gives me quite a lot of good ideas for how it might be implemented. And what's fun, especially, is that prototyping this for me should not be particularly a uh, particularly onerous hassle because recently I have received my copy of the... Actually, what's it called? Give me a second to find the box. This is not good.
Apologies for stepping away. It was the Board Game Design Starter Kit, which was a very neat little Kickstarter uh, that just recently arrived and was shipped out to everybody. Uh, that basically gives you a bunch of blank cards, a bunch of meeples, a bunch of dice, everything you need to make a prototype board game. And if I can use that to make a functioning prototype of this, it becomes trivial, really, to um, give the judges a working demonstration. Like, the first time I did this contest, I did it with nothing but... Uh, very crudely drawn cards and not just any cards flimsy note cards that you were usually used to write like trivia or reminders or like flashcards with right like they're basically just like flimsy bits of paper that's a little more stiff than, than usual that was a terrible experience um i don't recommend prototyping that way uh shuffling was extraordinarily difficult it wasn't very fun. Um, this should make things not only easier to prototype and, and rapidly test, but it should feel good to actually use, you know? I like that. Um, the whole thing about tabletop gaming versus like standard like video gaming is that it's just a lot more tangible feel to it. And a lot more of a like a social experience as well. Which means that I have been starved of a proper tabletop game for a while now because of this freaking pandemic and this country's refusal to deal with it in a mature way. Man, if I was back in Taiwan, if I was back in Taiwan, life would be back to normal already. That's sad. Anyhow, I'm starved. And my brain has been thoroughly plumbed for today. Which means it's time to bid adieu. Adieu? Yes, bid adieu, and I will see you tomorrow for some Persona 5 Strikers. Let's get back to grinding. Uh, thank you for watching, and as always, eat well, my friends.